Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to our uh, regular Thursday lunch that we're having on Wednesday. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I know it's starting Easter break here for those of you in Georgetown, so thanks for coming out today. Uh, we have a, a rare opportunity uh, to, uh, to hear from a probably one of the most uh, renowned uh, Korean scholars uh, that focuses on security uh, in Northeast Asia on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, Dr. Bruce Bechtel is a professor at Angelo State University in Texas. Uh, and I know you've all read his bio uh, and uh, know that he is a Marine. Uh, he's been an intelligence officer at the Defense Intelligence Agency. He's taught at uh, the Air War College in uh, Alabama as well as the Marine Corps uh, Command and Staff College at, uh, at Quantico. Uh, and many other assignments, including numerous years uh, in Korea. And so he is a um, really an example of someone who has been a lifelong practitioner uh, as well as a scholar. And so, like we like to talk about here in Security Studies, the nexus of theory and practice. Uh, he is able to, uh, to bring, that, uh, bring that together for us. He's also one of the most prolific writers on Korea. Uh, his latest book, which he's going to talk about, preceded by many more, Defiant, Failed State, um, Red Rogue, uh, and journal articles that uh, for me to list would probably take the next hour and a half uh, to, uh, to list. Uh, Bruce is a member of uh, a, uh, a small informal organization uh, which uh, like to, uh, to call, we like to call the All Too Few, uh, who study uh, we study Korean issues, and, uh, and we're joined today by a couple of our friends uh, and colleagues uh, through the years. Uh, Robert Collins is the former Chief of Strategy for the Combined Forces Command in Korea. I uh, spent more than 30 years in Korea, and he's the author of The Seven Phases of North Korean Collapse. And Greg Scarlatu is the Executive Director of uh, the uh, Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, uh, and uh, has uh, also uh, spent many years in Korea and focused on the Korean issues the four of us are, you know, longtime friends and, and colleagues. Uh, and in fact, in November, Greg and I were hosted by Bruce uh, down at Angelo State uh, University. So we have a long, uh, long relationship uh, in looking at these complex issues. So Dr. Bechtel is going to talk about his book um, for about probably about 30 minutes or so, give you an overview. Uh, and it is very timely and very, uh, very relevant to what is going on in the world as we focus on. Of course, the Middle East and Ukraine and uh, everything else. Kim Jong Un does not let uh, anybody's attention sway too far from the peninsula. Mm -hmm. And as we we know, you know, number one, uh, and this week we've seen, uh, 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 in fact, uh, Judge Kirby from the UN is here in town. Uh, has been with uh, with uh, Greg uh, this week and presenting the uh, human rights abuses that occur in North Korea. So that's a focus now. Of course, we know the nuclear issue is, is always uh, on everybody's minds. Uh, and yesterday, uh, Greg's organization also presented uh, a, uh, an important uh, report on North Korea's illicit activities uh, and something that also uh, Bruce is very, very well versed in. So he can talk to you, and I just close with saying that not only is he uh, a practitioner and, and a scholar, he also, you know, his time as an intelligence analyst uh, with the Defense Intelligence Agency and while he was on active duty as a Marine, retired Marine now, um, he spent a lot of time focusing on the North Korean military, their threats. So anything you want to ask about the nuclear program, missile program, uh, any of their asymmetric capabilities and their conventional capabilities as well as North Korean decision making are all a fair game for, uh, for Bruce. And if he doesn't know it, I'm sure he'll make it up. No. Uh, but, uh, I think uh, when you look at his books, one thing for all of you to remember, uh, those of you who are scholars and, and researchers, uh, one of the things you'll notice as you read his books, they are extremely well documented, well sourced, uh, with open source material. So if you are doing any kind of research on North Korea, I highly recommend reading his books because he has been able, his analysis is spot on uh, and of, of the, highest, uh, uh, the highest credibility. Uh, but he backs up everything with detailed open source analysis uh, and he's able to put it together uh, and, uh, and really give us insights to what's going on in North Korea. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Bruce Beck. Thank you. I think I'm gonna stand up here because we've got some extra, <coughs> extra people in the room and I want everybody to 
be able to see my ugly mug, which is what my daughter calls my face. Um, first of all, let me ask, are there any alumni here of the University of Iowa? No? That's too bad. I asked that everyone where I go, my daughter, the uh, apple of my eye, the center of my life, is a sophomore at the University of Iowa. So uh, I'd like to thank Dave for, uh, for having me here. I'm sure that all of you enjoy having him uh, and working with him in the Center for Security Studies. We have a Center for Security Studies at Angelo State University, which is where I teach, and uh, I was brought in. They, uh, they uh, um, wild me away from the Marine Corps Command and Staff College with money and steak <laughs> in West Texas. And uh, there was no Center for Security Studies in 2010. Uh, we built it from nothing. We have a Master's in Security Studies, which is similar to the one Georgetown has. In fact, when I built it again, myself and Dr. Nalbandov, a friend of mine who is from Georgia, the former Soviet Republic, not the peach place. Um, he and I built the security studies program from nothing. We now have you know, several professors teaching it, and it, the only real difference between it and, um, and Georgetown, of course, aside from the poofiness, is that uh, uh, we're all online. We are totally online. Um, that was part of the requirement for our program. So I have students all over the country, including DC, in Korea, in Japan, in, uh, in Greenland, I had a student in Greenland last year, and when we wrote our curriculum, we used Catholic University's International Affairs Program and Georgetown Security Studies Program as our template for our, uh, for our, uh, our program. So you, if you were ever to look at our website, you would find that much of our curriculum, our class titles, look a lot like Georgetown's. That's not an accident. And the reason I use Catholic University, by the way, was because that's where I got my master's degree. I was the uh, token Jew at Catholic U. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I thanked, uh, I thank Dave already. I, I'd like to thank my friends. Some of my friends are here. Um, Bob's son, Bob Collins, and Greg have already been introduced to you. Work actually worked for uh, one of our new guests who's here uh, in Korea, which was which was great. I got a great opportunity to sit down with them uh, a couple years ago. Um, I'd also like to thank, obviously, my friends for coming. Uh, my book, this book, read it. I, I like the author, he's a cool guy. Um, this book is dedicated to my oldest daughter, uh, Lisa, who is uh, living in Santa Monica, and she's an actress. But fear not, she's engaged to an investment banker. <laughs> uh, um, and my last book, The Last Days of Kim Jong Il, which came out about a year ago, was dedicated to my wife and my daughter who's at Iowa. So uh, there's nobody left in the family to dedicate it to, although we do have a beagle, so that may be, <laughs> that may be my next dedication. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is, um, you know, obviously what's contained in my book, but um, I'm not, and I, I tell people this all the time, I'm sure many of you have been told the same thing by Professor Maxwell, it doesn't take a genius to figure out North Korea. You can base almost everything that you do in your analysis from precedent, and I'll, and I'll address some of that today. Um, so what I'd like to do is kind of run through what's in my chapters and tie that in as much as I can with current events, because we've got a lot of meat to chew on um, in current events going on in North Korea. Um, and I'll have to take some water from time to time. Um, I still smoke cigars occasionally. My wife thinks it's the reason I had quadruple heart bypass 18 months ago. What does she know? Anyway, uh, so let's talk about some of the stuff contained in the first chapter of the book. North Korea's uh, WMD and proliferation policies. And I'm going to talk about the conventional military forces as well. When you watch CNN, um, if you're not sure what your political affiliation is, or if you're a lefty, you watch MSNBC, or if you're a righty, you watch Fox News, um, you're gonna get all kinds of stuff about North Korea's nuclear weapons program and pictures of the Tapo Dong taking off and stuff. It's what gets all the hype. So let me address what's been going on in the past couple of years. Since Kim Jong-un has taken over, um, he has quite simply Black and white carried out his father's policies. We saw two more Tapo Dong two tests, uh, one successful, 
one not, the one that was successful I think is very interesting because right up until they launched the missile, all kinds of so-called experts here in Washington and elsewhere, from think tanks to people in intelligence agencies were saying, their technology is far too primitive. They will never get this thing to go through all three of its stages. Well, guess what, Huckleberry? It went through all three of its stages. The North Koreans now have definitively, and have proven it, a missile that can hit Alaska or Hawaii, but not Texas yet. <laughs> um, I think this is very important. Another big argument that I'd like you to think about and it's kind of confusing because there's really no basis in science for it, is you see this argument all the time from, again, from CNN or Fox or MSNBC, you know, Think Tank, etc. Well, they don't have re-entry capability for the Taepodong 2 that we know of yet. Well, they've got re-entry capability for every other single missile that they have. The Musadon, which has a range of 4,000 kilometers, Scuds, no dongs, everything. They've got re-entry capability for that already. Why wouldn't they have it for the Tapo Dong? It's not that complicated. And if they don't have re-entry capability, something else to think about, and again, I put this in my book, is there has now been evidence for about the past year that the North Koreans are working on EMP technology. Does everybody know what that is? How many people know what EMP is? How many people don't know what EMP is? How many people have seen Three Phases of Eve? Joanne Woodward Academy Award winning performance. <laughs> anyway, um, EMP obviously, electromagnetic pulse technology, would mean they could fly a missile towards the southern axis of the Earth. It wouldn't have to enter the Earth's atmosphere and they could cause havoc in the United States wherever they wanted to. Are they there yet? I don't think so. But on the other hand, Five years ago, everybody was saying North Korea will never successfully launch a three-stage missile. And I like throwing that up in their face because I'm that kind of guy anyway. But something to think about. Something else that they continue to be working on that they've obviously made advances on is a missile called the Hwasong-13, or what some of you probably heard of as the KN-8. Have any of you seen pictures of that? Um, it's essentially, yeah, of course, I know you have. Of, of, of course, that's a missile um, that can be launched from a transporter erector launcher. Now, why is that important? For those of you who don't know this, and I know some of you do, but let me walk you through it anyway. Um, the Tapo Dong, when they set it up, takes at least a couple of weeks. They gotta bring down the missile on a train from the factory, or bring it up, I should say, because they bring it north. Then they gotta set it up. Then they gotta put the liquid fuel in it. All this takes time. Um, the Hwasong 13 or KN8, the reason that's much more of a threat, once it comes online, is because all they gotta do is run it anywhere in a transporter erector launcher, which is essentially just a semi, a big truck with a thing that lifts up like this, and they can just launch it. And that takes away our warning time. Why is that important for us? Because, as most of you probably know, every time North Korea launches a missile of any kind, even if they're just going out, like right now they have what looks like uh, a transporter erector launcher set up to launch something in the next few days. You can get, I guarantee you, there are submarines off the coast of North Korea, there are Aegis equipped ships that are out there, the Japanese have ships out there, the South Koreans do, the Americans do. That takes time to move those guys into position. If they have a missile that all they gotta do is roll it out and launch it, that's a threat. A bigger threat, it takes away our warning time. Um, they also have, in my opinion, likely at a minimum, um, a highly enriched uranium weapon already. I think it's as likely as not that the last missile, not missile, the last nuclear test that they did last year, from which no particles were allowed to escape, at which there were several Iranian officials there to observe it, was probably, probably an ATU test. Don't know for sure. But why would the Iranians be there if it wasn't an HEU test? Um, which means, right now, the North Koreans probably have a warhead for a missile, probably the Nodon, that they could shoot at Japan. Anything else is speculation. Do we know what they could put on a table dome? We know they can launch one and hit Alaska or Hawaii now, but what, what's the warhead they could put on it? Is that thing stable enough for a nuclear warhead? I don't know. There's no evidence one way or the other. But I'll tell you this, um, 
they could put a chemical warhead on that thing, and if they hit anywhere on the island of Oahu, they'll probably kill about 12,000 people. So just something to think about. Um, anyway, that's where they are with their, uh, their missile program. Um, they've developed some uh, weapons now that they can just pull out of caves and hit all of Seoul with. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And uh, there has been no change in their military procurement or acquisition. Uh, in fact, let me talk about their conventional forces. Again, this is in chapter two of my book. Um, DIA put out an unclassified document uh, about three months ago, which is their second version of it, which was misinterpreted by a lot of people. Um, North Korea, essentially what they've done with their conventional forces is, is they have maintained, upgraded, and continued to manufacture new pieces of 1960s vintage Soviet equipment. An example of this that to me is quite compelling is that since about 2006, they built 900 tanks. 900 tanks. Army guy, is that a lot? That's a lot of tanks. That's a lot of tanks. That would be a lot of tanks if the United States had produced it. These are guys that are building their military weaponry mostly by hand. So that's, that's a pretty big, I mean, a lot of their stuff isn't built on an assembly line. By the way, let me give you an anecdotal story. When I was at DIA way back in 1998, remember when Sri Lanka was fighting the Tamil Tigers? which by the way was another group that the North Koreans were selling to. So they were selling weaponry to the Mill Tigers and they were selling weaponry to the Sri Lankan government, which I think is pretty cool. They were doing the same thing in the Ethiopian Eritrean War. But I digress. They were selling machine guns to the Sri Lankan government to fight the Tamil Tigers. The only problem was the machine guns were made with a hand scythe. So when they're firing the machine guns, you know, and the guy's holding the shells they're going through, None of the barrels were the same size, so the rounds kept jamming up and they kept being overrun by the rebels, which isn't good when you're firing machine gun. <laughs> so sometimes their acquisition and sometimes their manufacturing doesn't go quite as well, but 900 tanks is a lot. Um, they have reorganized some of their key units um, in, for example, and this started in 2008, it's been completed, they reorganized roughly seven divisions in their forward corps into special operations forces divisions, light infantry divisions, about 49,000 men. Um, I, again, I have several retired, well, ones who are still on active duty. I have several guys with experience in the military here, and 50,000 guys being completely trained to do something else is a big deal. They took all the equipment they had, the standard infantry division equipment, pushed it down in the DMZ so they had even more of it down there, and then jump qualify all those guys, and now they have 50,000 extra special operations forces. They've done that since 2008. Um, so essentially what they've done is they've enabled and continued their ability to threaten South Korea with their conventional forces. And with their WMD, they continue to build it towards being able to threaten the entire region and their ultimate goal of the United States. So, let me talk about some recent events that this impacts on. And again, this is what I talked about in the first part of this lecture, boring to, boring to some people. There is nothing more exciting to me, Bob Collins will tell you this, than looking at disposition of forces and order of battle. Gets me going. And as my youngest daughter, who's 20, tells me, Dad, you're the most boring guy I know. <laughs> Can I borrow the car? <laughs> um, so if we look at events, uh, starting in late February, um, February, and, and some of the guys here have actually participated in this, I know Bob did, um, is, is a time when the United States and South Korea typically, routinely, every year have exercises, joint combined exercises, joint meaning more than one service, combined meaning more than one country, um, and this year they did some interesting stuff, according to the press, uh, which I'm sure is true, you know, simulating things going on in, in uh, North Korea. The Marines did some new things, the Rock Marines and the, uh, and the uh, U.S. Marines together. People asked me, Bruce, you were ever in the military? And I said, well, sort of. I was in a paramilitary organization, you know, the U.S. Marine Corps. But uh, <laughs> they did some very interesting things. The reaction from the North Koreans uh, was they fired MRL, multiple rocket launchers, off their east coast, hundreds and hundreds of rounds. Um, and they test fired, and this was about, I think this is the fourth time, 
fourth time, that they've tested a new 300 millimeter MRL system. Now, why is this a big deal? Why, why, it's not just that I am a weapons geek, that this is important. Um, the 300 millimeter MRL has a range of up to about 150 kilometers. That means that they could put it on the DMZ, fire it, and they could directly hit someplace like Osan Air Base or Camp Humphreys. It also means that this whole thing of with the previous MRLs they had on the DMZ, well, we get parts of Seoul, but not all of Seoul. They could cover all of Seoul. They could cover all of Kyogi Province with a range that this new system has. And they've been testing it a lot. And you can bet your bottom dollar they'll be deploying a bunch of these along the DMZ within the next year or two. Um, so they were testing that. Um, lots of live fires. That was, I think, a message for us. As my friend, who is now the advisor to uh, uh, President Park Geun Hye, uh, Dr. Chung, who is formerly of the Korean Institute for National Unification, several of you know him, he told me on the phone the last time I talked to him about this. He said, "Bruce, nobody's paying any attention to this. You know, all these live firings." I said, "It's not for the people in Seoul. It's for the government. It's for the military guys, so they understand." As we're doing our exercises, they're conducting these firings just to let us know. Uh, we got it, and we're still ready for you. Um, ironically, they did some other thing as well. They test fired scuds, um, free rocket over ground, which is called a anyone anyone Bueller frog ribbit. Um, and as the Japanese uh, minister, the U.S. secretary, and the rock minister were meeting in Europe, they test fired a no dong. Now, can anybody guess why they would do that? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? No one? Because the nodon can hit where? Ja right. So they, they sent a message with this. They were specifically firing different weapon systems with different ranges telling us, see, look what we could do. Have your fun, but here's what we could do. Uh, so interesting stuff. Um, my assessment of this is that the provocative behavior was sent as a message to all three countries, the US, the ROC, and Japan, that we're ready for you. But wait, there's more. Um, completely unrelated, on the West Coast, <clears throat> the North Koreans decided to fire a bunch of artillery rounds right along the NLL. And everybody here knows what the NLL is, right? The Northern Limit Line, essentially the maritime DMZ. Um, so the North Koreans fired a bunch of rounds uh, out very close to the NLL. Probably about a fifth of them went over the line in the South Korean waters. So how did the South Koreans react? Well, they fired a bunch of rounds in the North Korean waters. And they scrabble an F-15, which according to press reports had the very best armaments that the rocks have for an F-15, and they sent all the citizens that were on those five rock-occupied islands into the new shelters. They built all new shelters after the attack on Yamgongdo. And very interesting stuff, right? Now, why do you think the North Koreans did that? Um, well, a clue to that showed up a few days later when a North Korean drone crashed on one of those islands. What I think was going on was the North Koreans intentionally did this dry run so they could see how much the rocks had improved in their reaction time to a provocation from the North Koreans. Because we now were able to see how quickly people moved into those shelters, how soon they were able to get their artillery going in the counter battery fire, and how soon they were able to scramble those F-15Ks. And why would I think that? Well, because they had a drone that was up watching the whole thing. So um, if you don't think that's significant, Please allow me to remind you that in 2002, when the North Koreans attacked a South Korean ship, they did a dry run the week before. In 2010, when they attacked Yonpyongdo, they did a dry run about nine months before. This, my friends, was a dry run. And it was also what I called my friends in the TATF Society. The, uh, it was the Korean water splashing competition because, you know, <laughs> North Koreans parked some runs into our water. Well, we'll splash your water, too. <laughs> we can splash better than you can. Um, but wait, there's more. And by the way, please allow me to remind you that uh, um, Chapter 3 
in my new book covers nothing but how the South Korean government with their American allies would react to North Korean provocations. So I walk you through the context of what I'm talking about right now and then I talk about specific actions that the South Koreans have taken so that they would be more prepared for provocations. Because I think most of you agree with me when I say this, it's not if, it's when. They're just waiting for the right time. Um, so, like that's not enough, North Korea now appears ready to conduct a nuclear test. And um, like Bob Collins and Greg Scarlett too, Dave Maxwell, I get calls all the time from press outlets that you guys read but most people don't, like Voice of America, Chosen Oboe, and unless you're a Korean you probably don't read a lot of this stuff. Um, but I got asked by a reporter from the Doma Ilbo, um, how ready are the North Koreans to conduct a nuclear test? And my answer to that, and anyone can see this in the unclassified imagery you can now see on the internet, um, they have taken that site at Kyunggi, and what they've done is they've made it so within a matter of days it's ready to, to conduct a test. So is it ready now? Mm, yeah, pretty much. They could do a test in a couple of weeks, they could do a test in a couple of months. They can do a test in a couple of years. But right now they're talking rhetoric like they're going to do a test now. And does everybody know what I'm talking about? There was stuff in the press a couple weeks ago where they said they were going to do a new kind of test. What do you think that means? Anyone? Bob? It's you. Exactly. That's what I think. I think that soon, maybe in a couple of weeks, maybe in a couple of months, maybe in a couple of years, because I want to be as general and confusing as possible. <laughs> um, I think the North Koreans will not only test AGU, but they're going to do it publicly. In other words, they're, they're going to do it like they did all of their nuclear tests except the last one. They're going to do it, they're going to make sure we know, wow, the North Koreans have AGU, it's weaponized, and they just tested it. So something to keep in mind. Um, they now have, this second, today, a mobile launcher on the east coast of North Korea. Um, I don't know what kind it is, but uh, for you guys with the TSSCI, I expect a full briefing after this, all right? <laughs> kidding. Um, that's probably gonna be launched in honor of Kim Il-sung's birthday. Um, so we'll see what that is. I think that, you know, mobile launcher, I don't think their KN-8 is ready yet. That's that big ICBM. So probably a Musudan a range of 4,000 kilometers and can hit Guam. And by the way, I spent 81 and 82 on Guam as a young Marine, some of the best bars in Westpac. <laughs> it was a very tough tour. I laid on the beach a lot, I played football, I went to work once in a while. Um, but if they test the Musadon, I think that would be very interesting because um, they have not tested that missile yet, except in Iran which I just argued at with a bunch of BIA guys about a month ago. Um, but, you know, as, as far as I can tell, the evidence is they've tested it once in Iran, nowhere else. Um, they may be doing that as a public display for Kim Il-sung's birthday. If they test that new ICBM, that's, trust me, that'll be a big deal. All kinds of people will be screaming about that, and what do we do now? They have a, a missile on a tail that can hit, you know, Honolulu and Fairbanks, but not Texas. Um, <laughs> So that, that's, that's coming. Um, I think they will probably do, if it turns out this is not the KN-8, I think they will probably do some type of ICBM launch within the next year or so. And the reason I say that is not as a provocation or as brinkmanship, but simply because they need to keep testing those things, right? If you're developing weapon systems, you've got to keep testing them. So we can expect to see that on the horizon. Um, so my assessment is that North Korea is planning a violent provocation soon, as soon as they can find a way to get around what is very, very improved rock defenses, including rules of engagement. Um, they are probably gonna do a long range missile launch within the next few months or the next year or next week. Um, and we're gonna see another nuclear test than the next year. So, um, you know, if you're expecting North Korea to go out of the headlines, that's not what to expect. Now, let me talk for a minute, if I may, about provocations. My definition of a provocation is probably different than most people's. 
I do not think that launching the Tapo Dawn or you know test frying all these weapon systems like they did last month um, um, or rhetoric. I don't think that's a provocation. In my definition, a violent provocation is an intentional act meant to inflict casualties on the South. Anything else is brinkmanship. So, for example, this whole water splashing thing they just did with the South Koreans, that's brinkmanship. They came as close as they could to conducting a provocation without actually inflicting casualties. So keep that in mind. And I talk about how South Korea has taken great aims to uh, deter, detect, and counter any provocation from the North Koreans. They've actually done a very good job. They've changed the rules of engagement. They've actually started a Northwest Islands Command that put a two-star Rock Marine Corps general in charge. They've done, you know, they've reinforced the uh, shelters where the civilians can go to. They put improved artillery systems in there. They've done all kinds of good stuff. All in the book. Fascinating stuff. Nobody's laughing. All right. But that, that's in my uh, chapter three, which is the uh, provocations chapter. So let me talk about some other things that are going on in the military and then kind of move into uh, what's going on with uh, Kim Jong-un. Because another chapter I have in there, chapter four, is actually on what we're going to do, we being the US, the ROC, and the international community, particularly countries like China, Russia, and Japan, in the case of North Korean collapse. So, in 2011, Kim Jong-il entered his, uh, issued his first military order, Kim Jong-un did, right after his daddy died, and that first order was, anybody know that? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? No, um, that order was to bring all units back from being in the field, because it was in the middle of a winter training exercise, and shut down for a few weeks. That was his first order as the new leader of um, North Korea. Soon thereafter, weeks thereafter, there were signs of dissent, dissatisfaction within several units in the North Korean military. Um, this was met by some interesting things. Um, everybody understands that the institutions in Korea, North Korea, are a three-headed monster, right? You got the military, you got the security services, and you got the party. And they all are three separate institutions that basically run the country. Um, the security services started manning border posts along the border with China instead of military units. Very interesting stuff. This was, this was a few months after uh, Kim Jong-il's death. Um, there was even reports that North Korea was having problems getting rations to its civilians during big drills and exercises and stuff during the winter. Um, this has been a problem under Kim Jong-il in the past, but it apparently it was more of a problem early. Um, people, and I talked about this on the radio today, I gotta tell you, I look much better on the radio than I do in here. <laughs> but, uh, um, people were, were opining, and you guys who follow Korea know this, were opining before we saw Kim Jong-un do much stuff, or before he took over, that he would be more of a reformer, right? Some of you all remember that. Um, you know, he went to school in Bern, Switzerland. He had a picture of Michael Jordan on his wall. He's going to be a reformer, right? Please allow me to say, <clears throat> one of the first things that he did was um, during the mourning period um, for his father, uh, the assistant chief of staff of MPATH, Military People's Armed Forces, was caught drinking soju. Nothing wrong with that, right? They're Koreans. They drink soju. You drink soju? I drink soju. Um, in fact, people have said to me often, soju. But, um, <laughs> but uh, this guy was caught drinking soju. And Kim Jong-un ordered that he be executed so that not a hair existed on his head. They had him executed by mortar. You know what a mortar is, right? I know you guys know what a mortar is. Essentially, it's a mortar is an indirect fire weapon that usually fires like this and goes doop and then lands and blows up and kills people and stuff. And uh, this time they took it, lowered it like that, and just blew him to pieces. So we got a pretty good idea after that. Maybe that private school in Bern didn't take the natural <laughs> kid and bloodthirstiness out of him. <coughs> um, by the end of 2013, two thirds of the senior generals had been replaced, purged, or moved to different jobs. 
I want you military guys to imagine what the U.S. Army would be like if they did that to two-thirds of their generals. Of course, in the Marine Corps, that'd probably be a good thing. But, uh, I mean, that is a big deal, especially in an army that's 1.1 million men. Uh, so, interesting stuff. Um, their Armed Forces Chief of Staff were replaced several times. Kim Jong-un has already had more Armed Forces Chiefs of Staff first two years of his rule than Kim Il-sung had the entire time of his rule, or his father. That's a big deal. That shows a sign of instability in the military. And a uh, guy named Che yong hae is a guy that is now being called the, uh, the number two guy, and I'm going to say this several times in this presentation. I believe there's no such thing as a number two guy in North Korea. There never has been. There's always been a lot of guys who were sort of number two, but it is a patrimonial politics uh, nation state, if you will. They divide and conquer. That's how the Kim family rules. Therefore, there's no such thing as one number two. There never has been. Um, I think if you want anybody to explain that to you, Jung Sung Tech probably could have done it, but he's not available right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so there we are on that in the military. Um, and I'd like to point out once again, um, talking about that, and I address this a bit in the book just to give you some context. Um, if you are in the North Korean military, and some of you have heard me beat this drum before, there are three chains of command. If you're a fight, quote unquote fighting soldier, you answer to military people's armed forces and then the National Defense Commission. But if, if my name is General Kim, because that's what 60% of them are named, um, and I'm planning an operation, I've got General Khan looking over my shoulder from the General Political Bureau. I've got General E looking over my shoulder from the Military Security Command, which is the military version of the State Security Department. These two don't work with each other. They answer to separate chains of command, as do I. That is how the North Korean military works. There are three separate chains of command. So, who controls everything? Well, Kim Jong-un does. And before him, Kim Jong-il did. And arguably, for a while, Chiang sun tech had a lot of you know, input until he was blown apart by machine gun. And then his input ended, essentially. Um, the National Defense Commission, in my view, remains a very powerful entity. But as you read about names, and you'll see these names in my book, names like Kim Kyuk Shik. Anybody know who he is? Kim Kyuk Shik was the gentleman who planned, probably, <coughs> the attack on Yang Kyung Do. He's an artillery officer. He's also a longtime friend, and his family's a longtime friend of Kim Jong Il. Um, oh Kuk Yol, in charge of North Korea's Special Operations Forces. <laughs> has been a longtime friend of the Kim family forever. These are fighting generals. You also have generals like Che, who I just addressed, who's with the General Political Bureau. He couldn't fight his way out of a paper bag, but he's just as valuable to the Kim family, perhaps more so, because he spies on the fighting generals. You see what I'm saying? That's how things work. That's how the institutions work. And when there's turmoil, and all of those factions, there's turmoil in the military, and we've seen that more than I ever saw under Kim Jong-il. Um, well, how did this, uh, and again, that's in the military chapter. I have to talk about the leadership some because it's changed so much. It's been in such a state of flux. So, <coughs> all of you have seen stuff on what's been going on with John Sun Tech, right? And how he died, and he reportedly he was torn to pieces by dogs, and I don't think that's true, but it was one of the reports. Um, just so you know, and I was at, at uh, I was a SIGINT guy in the Marine Corps uh, back when Kim Ma, Kim Il-sung died. Kim Jong-un has purged more people than his father or his grandfather did when they first took over. His grandfather purged a lot of guys later on in the 50s. Um, even Kim Jong-il, when I was at DIA, and he, they would have several time periods where he would go through purges, um, has not purged as much all at once as Kim Jong-un is doing. Now, why do you think that is? Yes, sir? He had less time with his father than Kim Jong-il did with his, with his father, um, meaning that it, uh, Kim Jong-il died in 1994. Kim Il-sung. I'm sorry. 
Kim Jong Il died early, and he, um, during during his period under his father, he learned a lot more and could establish himself. True. And That's and you hit the point. What do you do when you're weak? When you when you don't have when you're trying to consolidate your power and you don't know who you can trust, what do you do? What's the P word? Ready, set, go. What did you say? <laughs> presidents. Presidents? No. Purge. <laughs> presidents we'll use later. No, I mean was, that's the presidents. Oh, that purge. is the president. Yeah, you purge. And, and and as Dave said, that that is the president. Um, everybody remember that because uh, it was all over CNN. I thought it was really cool. Remember the, the funeral procession for Kim Jong Il in the snow in Pyongyang, and you remember the um, um, limousine? I think it was a, an old Lincoln that they used as a limousine, and they've got the generals walking beside it and Kim Jong Il. Six of those seven guys have been purged or retired since then. What does that tell you? <coughs> um, massive security purges. I've already talked about the military. Massive purges have occurred in both the security services and the party um, and in the fall of 2013 not only was John first purged then executed my understanding I think the most likely means they executed him by was an anti-aircraft machine gun I don't think they tore him to pieces with dogs although they could have <coughs> along with him being executed many many other people were executed and hundreds were sent to re-education camps near the Chinese border um, and the reason that this is so important, well, there's a lot of reasons this is important. Um, John had power not just within the party. He had power within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He had power within the security services. And he had power within that nebulous Byzantine thing that your professor calls the KFR, the Kim family regime. He was a family member, albeit the fact he was known for What's the word I'm looking for? Catting around on um, on um, Kim Jong Il's sister, although she did the same thing. I'm sure most of you know she actually had a son with another guy and actually was living with a cello player uh, for several years. Yeah, it's, I, I mean, it's like watching some Byzantine family thing. It's very strange. But when you when you're a king, you can get away with just about anything, right? Um, so these purges have been going on essentially nonstop since Kim Jong-un took over. 2013 and the Big John thing was just the, most, the biggest because it affected so much. It affected all three of the key institutions in one way or the other. <coughs> so I've already talked about the three key institutions um, and the power base. Um, in order for Kim Jong-un to maintain power, he has to be able to control all three of those institutions. This is something he has not done yet. And I'm leading up to something as I, as, I, as, I, uh, as I say this. Failure to do so can easily exult, it result in implosion or civil war. Um, and how do you make sure that you can maintain those institutions if you, are, if you are unsure of your power or if your power base is weak? P word. I would make the faction spy each other. You would what? I would make the faction spy one another. Make them fight one another. Yes. Okay. Or, or you could purge. Yes. <laughs> Interesting points. Um, what made this set of purges with Jiang Zhang Tech so unusual? Well, for one thing, public purges are almost unheard of in North Korea. For some of us who've been following North Korea for years, we kind of snicker when we read the announcements at KCNA, <coughs> like, like the guy who was killed in an auto accident in Pyongyang four years ago. An auto accident? How many cars they got in Pyongyang? <laughs> Gee whiz, you know. Um, Drownings in March. Yes, he drowned by accident. He died of cancer, which he didn't have yesterday, and, and all kinds of other things. But they don't do public executions. Um, John was very public, in fact. They actually announced not only his execution, but why he was executed. And some of you probably even read the interview that their ambassador did to the UN with the British press, remember reading that? <coughs> so, very unusual. Um, and along with his, and I, I wrote this down so I could actually read this to you, along with his death there was high-ranking diplomats, party officials, military, security people, and functionaries at the state, provincial, and city levels, all executed. Literally, anyone they felt had contact 
with Chang Sung Tech of any meaning. Um, so very interesting stuff. Literally, and I'm reading this online, so I shouldn't be doing this, I should be doing this. But I was reading it online that uh, some of his, one of his in-laws, who was the ambassador to Malaysia, actually got on a plane and flew back so he could be executed. And you gotta wonder about a guy like that. Excuse me, could you please get on a plane so we can shoot you back in uh, North Korea? I'd be running so fast, but it's a different mentality. And uh, same with the ambassador to <clears throat> one of their UN ambassadors brought back and executed. Um, very scary stuff, very interesting stuff. By the way, has anyone ever seen a picture of, um, of uh, Kim Kyung Hee? <clears throat> My wife is Korean. I think Korean women are the most beautiful in the world. She's the ugliest one I've ever seen. She looks like Kim Jong-il with a wig on. I'm not kidding you. That is, so, anyway, I, I guess Jung Sung Tech doesn't have to worry about that anymore. But, uh, so why the massive purges? Um, in my opinion, and I think that's what's very important. Um, in my opinion, the real reason that John was executed, uh, and of this, to me, there could be no doubt, is because he could presented a compelling threat. Now, a lot of people have said, and they were correct, um, that he was corrupt. But accusing a high-ranking North Korean official of corruption is like accusing a Confederate soldier of murder at Gettysburg. You know what I mean? It, 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 I mean, they're all, who's corrupt? Well, which guy do you want to look at today? I, I mean, yeah. there was a lot of corruption. The, the key here is while that was probably at least an ancillary part of the problem, he presented a compelling and immediate threat to the power of Kim Jong-un. He was creating factionalization within the North Korean government. That has not existed since way back in the 1950s. That was a threat that had to be destroyed along with, as you guys know, I'm Jewish, you know, what did, what did the Israelites do? We're gonna kill you, your family, we're gonna bring your house down, we're gonna, we're gonna burn everything. And Anyway, you know, some things just should not end, I think. But uh, that's what they did. They, they destroyed everything that even could be loosely associated with Chang Sun Tech because he presented a threat. And I want you to understand that the corruption thing was important, but what was really important that, was that he had the potential for t usurping and factionalizing the government. And that's why I think he was executed. So. So, um, I think everyone could probably agree that Kim Jong-un is easily the weakest leader um, that has existed in North Korea since, uh, since the early days of Kim Il-sung. Um, he has a lack of support in the military that he needs, at least thus far. Um, the security services have crept down, but I've been reading a lot of stuff in recent months that says the security services are overwhelmingly corrupt now because so many of them are dealing in this illicit economy that Dave Maxwell talked about earlier. Um, and the biggest analytical mistake, and I hope you guys don't make this, is who's the number two in North Korea? Yeah, there's a bunch of them. I mean, it's, a, it's legitimate to say this guy is a powerful guy in North Korea. It's not legitimate to say he is the second most powerful guy. And, and even when I was an intel weenie, at DIA, we argued about that all the time. I wasted hours talking about that. You know, is Cho the most, second most powerful guy? Is he not? You know. And, um, so, what does the future hold? Well, I think the future is very bright. You know, as I've been laying out for you, um, it, we can expect more large-scale purges as a matter of survival. Brinkmanship and provocations will continue in 2014, and you guys now understand. What I mean when I say brinkmanship and what I mean when I say provocations. Proliferation and illicit activities will continue in order to generate revenues for the regime. That's my next book, by the way. Um, any major catastrophic event could cause the regime to implode within the next three years, I believe. Um, was the Jiang event enough? No, it, it was a pretty big deal, though. And uh, finally, Kim Jong-un is probably weaker, not stronger, than he was 24 months ago. Again, purges are not a sign of strength. They are a sign of weakness. And so we're seeing, 
uh, a regime that has problems. Um, and, and let me remind you, in order for Kim to survive, he has to have guys that are loyal to him in all three of those key institutions. Not just in the institutions, leading the institutions, but in all the sub-institutions of those institutions. For example, my mentor, Bob Collins, taught me all about the organization and guidance department. It was boring stuff, but I, I understand it and I believe in it now. Um, that's one key aspect of the party. He has to have the loyalty of the organization and guidance department and basically run it. And he has to have the loyalty of other departments within the party and the military, fighting generals and spying generals and the security services which spy on everybody in North Korea and each other. All splintered. So, something to keep in mind. If this doesn't work, what do we need to know? Anyone? We need to know what to do. I feel like that guy in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Bueller? Bueller? Um, we need to know what to do when North Korea collapses. Um, is the United States military planning for a collapse of North Korea? Yes. Of course they are. Um, South Korea is planning for the collapse. Um, if you want to know in unclassified terms from completely open sources what our government, the South Korean government, and the international community is planning to do if North Korea collapses, read chapter four of my book. Um, so. Um, if we're going to get to um, what happens over the next three years, if he's able to consolidate power, that is to say Kim Jong-un, um, he is going to have to use the same model his father used. Now, again, I was an intel guy when Kim Jong-il was running the country in the early days of his regime, and it really did take him a few years to consolidate his power. He wasn't even named to all those senior positions, like head of the NDC and and... Uh, head of the party and some of that other stuff until 1997, three years after Kim Il-sung died. Think about this. Kim Jong-un was named to all those positions within a month after Kim Jong-il died. Now, why do you think that was? Did, did it make him powerful? No, there, it was just positions. But it was for the uh, uh, North Korean people to see, okay, well, he's assumed power. He really is in power. Is he actually in strong power? I don't think so. Not yet. The jury's still out. So what does that leave us? That brings me to chapter four of my book, or chapter five, I should say, um, which is on the ROC military. That leaves the ROC military and the United States military with this horrible quandary. We have to face out against an enemy that has a 1.1 million man army that constantly wants to show us what they can do with that army and that occasionally uses that army to attack their South Korean neighbors. An army that is always poised for attack and has been since 1953. And they've been constantly maintaining it and building it up since that time frame. We have to be ready for that. But at the same time, we have to be ready for that country to completely fall apart and all that that means. And so you guys understand, and we've got a lot of ex-military guys here as well, that is, in, in military terms, that's an entire marine expeditionary force. That's several numbered air forces. That's um, how many army divisions probably be to use? Five or six. Five or six, to well, use Monty Python US, terms. Pardon me? U.S. Army divisions. U.S. Army, yeah. Uh, to use uh, Monty Python terms, a lot. But, um, so it's a big deal. I mean, that would be one of the biggest military operations the United States had undertaken in the last 60 years, if they collapse. And that's what the Iraq military and the U.S. military have to prepare for, that two-headed monster. Um, I hope, I think, I, I believe that, that collapse is the most likely scenario, and I hope that that's what happens because there'll be a lot less guys dying if that's the case. Um, but that's, that's my fifth chapter. And uh, there's only six chapters in the book, and the sixth chapter is the conclusion. Um, so my assessment is that uh, Kim Jong-un has less than a 50-50 chance of succeeding as a leader of the DPRK. So if he fails, um, the DPRK fails, and thus implosion, explosion, or civil war. Um, Seoul and Washington right now are planning for this. If you want to know in an unclassified, open source sense, what they're doing, what's going on, read my book. 
It's all right there in chapter 4. Um, but in my mind, just allow me to conclude, uh, and I'm serious when I say this, um, the worst scenario is if the Kim Jong-un people and Kim Jong-un figure out a way just to continue crawling by. And that's the very worst scenario in my mind, because that means the misery in North Korea is just going to go on and on. That's what I got, and I'm ready for questions. <laughs> that's, that's not just a question, that's the question. I mean, that is something that guys like these three guys have been planning for for a lot of years. We've got a lot, of, uh, a lot of history of intellectual capacity among these three guys. I'm not just kissing up to them. Although that's not a bad idea. <laughs> but uh, but uh, the big question has always been, you know, what happens when, uh, when there's anarchy or collapse or civil war and there's no really, you know, and we're fighting a war perhaps. Maybe it happens at the end of a war we're fighting. Maybe it happens... Um, as the government's imploding, there's a lot of ways, a lot of things that can lead up to that. But the bottom line is that makes it more difficult for us because who do you deal with if there's nobody in charge to get guys to lay down their weapons? You see what I'm saying? And fortunately, we've got a whole lot of people that really speak good Korean in that thing called the Rock Army. So I would, you can laugh. But uh, I mean, South Korea is planning on this. We're working with them. That is one of the biggest issues, is command and control of forces when this kind of thing happens. And who do we deal with, and how do we deal with them? So, <coughs> I think, uh, you know, let, I, I'm giving you the condensed version, but I think if we're doing an operation up there, and the scenario that's gone down is there's anarchy or civil war, and units are fighting each other, and they're still armed, they haven't laid down their arms, I think most of the guys who will be doing stability ops, actual car actually carrying rifles, walking through villages, they're going to have an ROK flag on their shoulder, not the stars and stripes. We're going to be there for support. Does that make sense to you? Now you got to buy my book, man. I mean, I, I talk about that in my book, and a lot of that is guesswork because at least in unclassified channels that I know of, the Chinese have not agreed to um, publicly talk to us about it. And you can understand why. I mean, at least on paper, um, they are North Korea's ally. So, you know, it'd be like us saying to a NATO country, hey, we're gonna talk to somebody else about what happens, you know, when France collapses. You know, they're not gonna do that. Um, perhaps behind closed doors, that's happened already, I don't know. Um, but uh, please allow me to offer a scenario up to you, okay? Let's say it's 2015, when my daughter will be a junior at Iowa, and I'll still be broke. <laughs> and and uh, North Korea, some of the things I've talked about have happened, and North Korea is falling into anarchy. Pak Gun Hye, who by the way I'm a big admirer of, um, calls in the Chinese ambassador and says, the time has come. The window's open. What will it take to keep you out of the game? And the Chinese ambassador will say, how nice of you to ask me that, Madam Park. I've got the following demands. And he'll pull out you know, the papers and say, we want port rights, we want mineral rights. Essentially, we want everything that the North Koreans had, at least for this number of years. And we want, if you're going to go up there and conduct stabilization operations, we don't want any American combat units north of the DMZ. There's all kinds of things that could possibly be in there. and." We want U.S. troops off the peninsula in five years or three years or whatever it is. And President Park will say, you got it, Huckleberry, and they'll move on. And, uh, and we'll eventually move on because our job there will be done, right? So, I mean, I think that there is potential for that. Let's hope that that happens and let's hope that us and the Rocks who work together are not working separately without communicating with the Chinese. That is not going to work. Does that make sense to you? Well, it should. Um, I, I can tell you, as a guy who was at DIA, 
uh, who spent probably 45 minutes on the phone with the USFK J2. Everybody knows what a J2 is, right? The intelligence branch of a joint command. Um, every day at work I did that. I hated those guys. Um, I mean, we were always arguing then, and they're still arguing now. Can they do this? Can they not do this? That's good. I mean, that to me, that's good. It's good to get all those opinions out there, but let's not forget some just a few figures. MRLs that can now hit all of Seoul. Um, improved number of scuds. Um, 900 tanks in the past eight years. Um, heightened training levels with special operations forces. Revised planning. Move, reorganization of units. This is not a military that is standing in place and they are by no means a military that we should just set aside. And um, they are big and they are not Iraqis. If we ever got in a fight with North Koreans, they may have antiquated equipment, they may have outdated and very difficult tactics because they fight like communists, obviously. Chain of command is very difficult. But if you think they're not going to fight, you're wrong. That, that's the way it is. This is a real enemy and we need to take them seriously. And, and that's, you know, if I, if I could just move on a little bit from that, um, that's part of the dilemma. We have to plan for that while at the same time planning for this huge um, army to collapse because that's even more likely than them, them starting a war with us. Another thing that's very important is my good friend Bob Collins said something um, that for once was profound in, uh, in 2010. And that was at a conference I put together at uh, Quantico. And he said, you know, we've been very good at deterring the North Koreans from attacking in a, in a large-scale war since 1953. We have not been good at deterring against provocations. Yeah. And that's a big issue. I think, the, you know, what you're talking about is great question, and it's very important, but that's more long-term. In the short term, I think we really need to... Uh, be focusing on anti-provocation because I think that's going to be on the horizon very quickly. Does that make sense to you? But uh, I'm, get, I'm actually giving a paper on this where I talk about their proliferation. <coughs> and why do I bring up proliferation? Because proliferation is not an ideological thing <coughs> for the North Koreans. It's purely about making money. So, you know, they'll even barter. For example, they're training infantry units right now in Zimbabwe so that they can get free uranium. So Zimbabwe is trading uranium for training of troops. And, and uh, the Congo is doing the same thing. They're trading, uh, what's that mineral that goes in cell phones? They're trading out with North Koreans. I'm trying to imagine how well a North Korean cell phone works. I don't want to even think about it. But the point is, those activities really were stepped up under Kim Jong-il in order to bring in those resources. And so I don't think that's more or less of a problem now than it was. He's still got to keep that five to 50,000 people happy. And he does that through proliferation and illicit activities. That's where they get, get their real money to do that kind of thing. Um, yes, he is weak. And to, to get to the short answer, because I know you don't want me to keep babbling on forever on this, um, just use precedent. And his father um, was brought into the government in 1974, okay? His dad died in 1994. So from 1974 until 1994, he had 20 years to break in. And they did it very slowly with him. He, you know, he was like a movie maker for a while, and he sat in a party for a while, did different things. This guy could tell you more on that than anybody else, because he's, he's written extensively on it. But um, by the time 1992 roll around, two years before his dad died, he was a six, not a five, a six-star general in the army, a marshal, even though he'd never been in any military training. Uh, so he ran the army, the military. He was head of the party. He ran the organization and guidance department in that party, the most powerful part of the army, and he was head of the Ministry of People's Security. He was there. He was ready to go, and his dad was actually uh, passing on a lot of his power to him. None of that existed when Kim, uh, Kim Jong-il died. Essentially what happened with Kim Jong-il was um, he wasn't doing anything to pass on stuff to his sons. I wrote a book in 2007 called Red Rogue, uh, The Persistent Challenge of North Korea, 2995 Potomac Books, probably the bookstore. But anyway, in that book, 
I, I, I'm, I was opining, as I often do, about who the next leader of North Korea would be and how it would work. And, you know, I was pulling my hair out trying to figure it out. Well, they tried the second son. And the second son, according to Kim Jong-il's Japanese chef, former Japanese chef, is, and I'm quoting him, this, these are not my words, was too much of a girly man to be um, the leader. Apparently, he was quite effeminate, which obviously would not be a problem in the United States or most countries. They don't, their culture is different than ours. Plus, they're commies, you know? They're not good guys. Um, they're racist, they're biased, you know, to be frank. Um, and he, he just, he couldn't cut it. So um, the other son, the oldest son, Kim Jong-nam, um, got caught trying to get into Tokyo Disney on a Slovenian passport. And you guys know all about that, right? Excuse me, sir, are, are you Slovenian? Oh, yes, yeah, so you know, I, I'm a Slovenian. My family is not Slovenian. Um, so he was done. So what are you left with? You're left with the third son, Kim Jong-un, which, by the way, is also my wife's name. And, the, and what it says in her license plate, Virginia, Jung Un. And people were honking at her all the time. Why are they honking me? Well, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, so it got to him. Well, what did that really mean? It meant that his succession process didn't even really start until the fall of 2009. So his dad dies in December of 2011. That's about 20, 26 months he had to get broken in and do all the stuff he needed to do. Not enough time. Not enough time in a slow-moving, autocratic, communist government. So, as I said before, they can give him all those titles, just like they gave his dad. But it doesn't mean anything if you don't have the, to, for lack of a better term, uh, the panache. If you don't know the dudes, you know, like, I went to Manyang Day with this guy. Therefore, we work together, our wives know each other. You see what I'm saying? None of that existed like it did for his father. So I think that is the fact that he hasn't really built a power base yet. Um, that's the biggest problem. He may build a power base. You know, I said 50-50. I mean, you could say 40-60 or 70-30. Who knows? But it's all dependent on can he build a power base and control those key institutions. And if he does, then we better just get ready for the long haul. Please, very good, very good uh, thoughts. Please allow me to uh, offer discount, some, discount them. No, no, no. <laughs> Please allow me to offer Please something do. else up for you, and that's um, if, you, if, if again looking back at precedent, because the North Koreans generally you can learn things from rather than trying to use sophisticated international relations models, which I'll forget anyway. Um, um, it's good to look back at precedent. Although Maxwell likes to use those. No, but, uh, no the students have to remember those. <laughs> <laughs> I have to teach an intro to security studies. I got to teach uh, um, liberalism, constructivism, and, and realism. So uh, <laughs> I've become very well acquainted with those things. I stole that from you guys' class, by the way. But uh, anyway, uh, um, it, you know, you make a very good point about the provocations because I think the North Koreans, and I'm, I don't know if he was in the decision-making process back then or not, that he was still in the process of being mentored, obviously. Um, I think they underestimated the South Koreans. And when I say the South Koreans, I mean the populace. I don't think that they realized that the South Korean populace would get in such a huge uproar. I mean, I, we were all there during that time frame. And, and uh, you know, and I say this as a compliment, South Koreans are like Jews. All Koreans are like Jews in that, in that casualties in war are hugely important for them, especially civilians. And when those civilians got killed at Yangbyong Do, that was all she wrote. That, that, that's when South Korean populace was just extremely upset. That Northwest Islands Command, I don't know how well it's working. Everything I read says, yes, it works well. Well, we don't know yet. But boy, I'll tell you, the South Koreans reacted pretty well to that, that uh, splashing exercise. Uh, they pretty well, pretty quickly, at least according to the press reports. Um, but if you look at precedent, um, in 1999, South Korea and North Korea had two ships that were banging each other, ramming each other, throwing garbage and fishing each other. And the North Koreans got stupid and decided to fire a few rounds at the South Koreans, and they gutted the ship. I mean, they, they just de destroyed everything that was on that ship. And the North Koreans took three years to get back at them. 
from 1999 until 2002, and then they attacked them. They took three years to figure out a way that they could get revenge for that. And so, if we're looking at, at um, Yan Kong Do and the Chonan, and that was four years ago, roughly, give or take, um, what are the North Koreans doing now? They said, well, we can't do provocations anymore. I don't think so. I think what they're doing is they're taking the time to gauge the South Koreans and see how they could conduct another asymmetric and successful attack and they just haven't figured out a way to do it or if they have they just uh, haven't carried it out yet uh, but boy they better be careful this time they, they better do it right because uh, as you know that just so everybody knows here I think the South Koreans are itching on the trigger right now they're, they're, they're just waiting um, but great stuff I agree with you <laughs> I don't know it because because titles mean things sometimes in North Korean government and sometimes they don't um, let me give you an example uh, Kim Kyok-shik um, was the chief of staff of the military people's armed forces right and Korean people's army and um, he was <coughs> removed from his position in 2009 at the end of 2009 and the rock press Chosen Ilbo, Donga Ilbo, you know, Korea Times are all saying, he's been fired, he's out of favor. You know where he went? Can you guess? He went to Fourth Corps. You know where Fourth Corps sits? On the NLL. Yeah. He became the Fourth Corps CG and he planned the attack on Yon Pyongdo. So you just never know what the press says. Um, I don't know. And, I, and I'll take that one step further. I don't know who the chief advisors um, to uh, Kim Jong-un are right now. Che, the guy who's the GPB guy in the military, supposedly one of them, mm, that could be true. Um, but I mean, it looks like his aunt's fallen out of favor, Kim kyung hee uh, probably for nothing more than being married to that guy. Of course, he did divorce him the day he was executed. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think that that's part of the problem for Kim Jong-un is, is uh, he hasn't got a set group of guys yet. He's got some, but he doesn't have that set group of guys that he can absolutely positively trust the way Kim Jong-il did about three years in his term. Does that answer your question? Yes. Other questions? We're all done? Go buy my book. Thank you. <laughs> all right.